Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, dozens of people are killed and abducted by armed attackers in central Nigeria. Although organized mass raids are unusual in Plateau State, it shares a border with Kaduna State, which has seen an uptick in robberies and kidnappings by gunmen. Also, the pushback against Tunisia's president ramps up. The country's political crisis intensified as hundreds of protesters rallied over the weekend denouncing Kais Saeed's power grab and recent dissolution of parliament. And Africa's art, music and fashion are taking up more international space. Its design scene, though, is equally as rich but attracts less attention. That is set to change. I speak to in-demand Nigerian industrial designer Nifemi Marcus Bello about growing global desire for African contemporary design. But first, at least 50 people were killed and around 70 kidnapped in central Nigeria in a wave of attacks on nine villages in Plateau State. Some witnesses claim the death toll could be above 100. Sunday's violence is unusual there, but it does share a border with Kaduna State, where armed gangs blew up train tracks just last month. Samuel Okoya has more. Eyewitnesses say the attackers came on motorcycles in large numbers. The gunmen who carried assault rifles attacked people in several villages, shooting at them indiscriminately. The actual death toll is unclear, but some reports say more than 100 people might have been killed. Videos from the area show a lot of corpses loaded in vans. The corpses were later discharged into shallow graves for mass burial. The mass burials come as more corpses are being re recovered. Sources in the area say the death toll from the attack is high because the military got there more than 24 hours after the attack started. Bad terrain has been blamed for the military's slow response. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, but it is believed to have been carried out by illegal miners who have been at loggerheads with local people. Minerals worth millions of dollars have been illegally mined in the Wase and Kanem areas. Those involved in this illegal mining include armed groups who have been terrorizing people in North Central and Northwest Nigeria. The armed groups known as bandits are behind the recent attack on a train during which some passengers were killed while others were abducted. President Muhammad Buhari is under pressure to address the growing insecurity caused by the bandits. Sam Olakoya there for us. Now, the gunmen who carried out the attack on a train in northwest Nigeria last month have released a video appearing to show about two dozen of those who were abducted. The hostages are shown sitting in a forest in front of a line of gunmen. One of the captives appears to be the CEO of Nigeria's Bank of Agriculture, Alwan Ali Hassan. Now, it's not clear, clear when the video was shot, but Ali Hassan has already been released. He was freed before the Muslim month of Ramadan in what his captors said was a goodwill gesture. The corruption trial of former South African President Jacob Zuma has been postponed again. Having started last May, it was due to resume again on Monday, but Zuma's legal team said that he was too ill to attend and filed for further postponement. The 79-year-old faces 16 counts of fraud and corruption over the purchase of fighter jets during his vice presidency in the 90s. The lead prosecutors accused Zuma of employing delaying tactics. And Tunisia's political crisis continues to fuel popular frustration. Over a thousand protesters took to the streets over the weekend, accusing President Kai Saeed of running a failed dictatorship. Many members of parliament that was dissolved last month joined in the rallies. Laurent Berstecker has more. Back in force in the streets of Tunis, thousands of Tunisians rallied in the capital on Sunday, chanting slogans and waving the country's red and white flag in a show of defiance against President Kai Saied. Kai Saied turned against himself. He turned against the people and against the constitution, which he had sworn to respect. On March 31st, Saied dissolved Tunisia's already suspended parliament after some of its members held an unofficial online session. A few days later, several key opposition figures, including the head of Tunisia's Islamist Enahda party, were questioned by judicial authorities over their role in an alleged conspiracy. Syed's opponents, meanwhile, say his moves against parliament amount to a coup and have left Tunisian democracy in peril. 
But the ongoing protests against the president were also anchored in his failure to pull Tunisia out of a deepening economic crisis. It's a political crisis that is growing, taking root and weighing heavily on the Tunisian economy and finances, on the daily life of Tunisians. The situation in the country is getting worse. In an address to the nation on Saturday, Kais Sayed defended his roadmap to hold parliamentary elections in December. But the announcement failed to appease critics, who are demanding a vote within 90 days, as required by Tunisia's constitution. Now, historically, from Mordigliani to Picasso, African art has inspired the work of some of the West's most famous artists. Fashion and music also attract contemporary international attention, but design from the continent less so. But that is changing. Just last month, Burkina Faso's Francis Guerre became the first African to win the prestigious Pritzker Prize for Architecture here in France. saint Etienne International Design Biennale is the latest major event on the European cultural calendar to very deliberately dedicate space to Africa's creative sector. One of those exhibiting is Nigeria's Nefemi Marcus Bello. He joins me now from Lagos. Nefemi, uh, thanks very much for joining us. Now, uh, you've got around internationally, appearing in Vogue, wallpaper, you've exhibited all around the world. How much do you think that is a reflection of, of a growing global appetite for African design? Um, I think it's, it's showing what um, the amount of good work coming out of Africa, contemporary design-wise, I think in general, for me, one of the things that I see is a lot of contextual approach to um, creating modern day design solutions for us, um, for, the, for, for the continents by young designers like myself. Um, here's a tough one. What is African design? Is it nationality, where the designs are conceived, something else? What's your take on it? <laughs> Um, I still, I feel like I'm still, I'm still answering that. What Af what contemporary African design is, for me, what I try to do within myself and my practice is, I focus on the now, and I approach it from a contextual standpoint, and also very high consideration around production and manufacturing techniques available across the continent and close to me as well. So gravitating towards that, I think. In my own opinion, that kind of answers what contemporary African design is, which is heavily contextual to the material and the people around them. So what happens when you change the context? So you're exhibiting at the St. Etienne uh, Design Biennale. Do you expect that uh, French audiences will engage with your work differently from, let's say, African ones would? Um, I think so. I think, for me, one of the things that I like about the approach that I take and my contemporaries are taking is, again, we're looking at the global market as we design, we're considering the diaspora as we design. Um, we're also figuring out how the best way to consume our products are. So while we're designing, we're considering a lot of these things that maybe some of our counterparts didn't in the past. So what do you think is changing about um, African design as such? Um, I think it's a, the approach of new technology that's available around the continent. Um, there's a heavy presence of production and manufacturing in various sectors. And I think a lot of designers like myself are looking into these sectors and figuring out how we can create economic viability and consumer products um, that people can sort of relate to and have an emotional connection to, connection with. And so why is it more difficult to um, guarantee or count on the economic viability of African or specifically, in your case, Nigerian uh, design products than it would be perhaps uh, elsewhere outside of the continent? Uh, I think for me, one of the things that I really um, think is the issue is um, distribution. Um, I think, but I think in recent times with borders opening up um, across the continent and hoping that the um, free trade zone um, activation happens soon, I think in general that will help out with um, logistics and 
production across the continent. And, and how does your Nigeria culture affect your approach to design? Who do you design for? <laughs> I design for um, the people around me and how their their current behaviors. I feel like as New Age Africans, the way we live um, in comparison to previous times is totally different. What's available, what's not available, the constraints of around us are totally different. So I think one thing I do is I try to figure out what these constraints are and design around these constraints to help enhance daily lives um, and emotional um, connections through materiality. So do you ever sacrifice the aesthetic for the function? Uh, a few times, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a few times, a few times. I think for me, um, one of the cornerstones of good design is functionality. Um, and in a heavily contextual side of things is also creating economic viability. So designing it with a local context. And in that, in some aspects of design, in my own opinion, that's also a function as well. And, and how do you think that globalization is influencing African design? Um, oof, that's a tough one because I think in general, uh, it's reducing the amount of old age technology that's um, available in a sense, uh, because a lot of products are being brought in from uh, the West into Africa, and we're consuming some of these products at a high um, high scale in comparison to the local products that we, we're used to. So I think globalization is affecting a lot of our old age tech, um, techniques and ba basically putting them in the dark. But a few designers like myself are trying to highlight these techniques by introducing contemporary ways and contemporary design ideas and direction to bring new life to them. Thank you so much. Nefemi Marcus Bello there, and you can catch his work at the St. Etienne Design Biennale uh, until June, I think it is. Well, that is, though, unfortunately, all we have time for for Eye on Africa. Thanks for joining us, and do so again if you can. Till then, take care.